Okay, with a little better idea of the problems affecting marine weather and marine weather forecasting, let's get started. This morning, we're fortunate to have with us Ken McKinley from Locust Weather in Rockport, Maine. Ken is a well-known meteorologist, provides routing services to a variety of recreational and commercial boaters, is a regular instructor at the Star Center in Florida and my tags in Maryland, uh, and is well known to the Marion Bermuda and Newport Bermuda race groups. Ken provide us this morning with something of a primer on marine weather fundamentals. Met 101. Ken? Thanks, Frank, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I have talked to several of you who have uh, seen the video of the prior presentation, and, and some of this that I'm going to do this morning will be a bit of a repeat of that with a little bit more of a Pacific emphasis for those folks in this part of the world. Um, but basically, my job is, is to give you some building blocks of fundamental weather, and, and necessarily, we'll have to go through some stuff fairly quickly. So I apologize in advance if I race through some things and uh, don't give them the, the time that I might ordinarily had I have more time. Uh, and the other thing I'm going to tell you is, as, as I was watching Frank up here, if at some point you need me to shift left or right so you can see what's on the screen, then wave your arms and tell me to do that. Uh, because I realize that uh, the projector is not higher than my head as it was in the previous venue, so please feel free to do that. So at any rate, uh, I'll start by talking definitions and concepts, uh, laying some building blocks. Frank alluded to the general circulation of the atmosphere. We'll take a look at that very briefly in, in theory and in some real data as well. We'll talk a little bit about weather systems. We don't have time today to hit all weather systems, but we want to talk about fronts. Uh, the mid-latitude or extratropical, meaning outside of the tropics, low pressure system. And we'll also spend some time on upper level or 500 millibar concepts. So that's what I'm going to do. And then moving on, as uh, Frank said, we have uh, present presenters after me that will follow on to that and give you a little bit more detail or go into some more uh, uh, interesting things about uh, this subject as we move forward. So where do we start? Frank talked about Admiral Fitzroy. Definition of atmospheric pressure. Everybody has a barometer on board, right? Okay. Definition of pressure at a given point defined as the force exerted by the column of air directly above that point. One of the things that we're going to try to impress this morning is that the atmosphere is three-dimensional. We live here at the surface, and you play on the surface of the ocean. We live on the surface of the land. And so for a lot of us, it seems like we're looking at north, south, east, west, which is two-dimensional. But in reality, we have a three-dimensional situation here as the fluid extends out toward outer space. And that uh, slice of fluid above a given point has mass. And so that mass, because of gravity, exerts a force. And we define that uh, force as atmospheric pressure. We measure it in a couple of different units, force per unit area. Commonly used units uh, for meteorologists, it's millibars. And you've seen that on the charts. If you're overseas, you may see uh, the unit of hectopascals. The convenient uh, juxtaposition between those two units is that they're the same. So the numbers are the same. 1,013 millibars is 1,013 hectopascals. On barometers, older ones in particular, you see it uh, denominated in inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury. Um, Average atmospheric pressure, meaning the average overall time at the surface, is 29.92 inches of mercury, or these other numbers in the other units that we're used to. 1,013.25 millibars, average atmospheric pressure. Okay. We can measure atmospheric pressure at many different locations simultaneously. Observation system that Frank talked about. And if we do that, we can collect the data, and then we can plot that data on a map, and then we can uh, draw lines of equal pressure, which we call isobars, and that allows us to visualize the pressure field. We can put a bunch of numbers on a map, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to your brain until we put those lines on there. Now I can see what we're talking about here. It's the same thing as drawing a, uh, a contour map. If you're going to hike up a mountain or something like that, you can see where the mountain is steepest by looking at the contour. So measuring atmospheric pressure is very important as we start off. So definition of pressure. Again, we're in definitions and concepts here. Uh, talk about wind. Wind is the horizontal movement of air. You guys like wind, right? But not too much. <laughs> Just right. 
okay? The horizontal movement of air, defined as wind, okay? What makes wind? Well, here we go. Uh, there are several forces that affect the horizontal motion of air. One is what we call the pressure gradient force. Because that definition of pressure, we have a column of air above us that weighs something. If we have a relatively high pressure here, in other words, the column of air weighs something more than average, let's say, and if I walk over here and I measure the pressure over here and the column of air doesn't weigh as much, the pressure is lower, we're gonna get a force exerted in the horizontal from the higher pressure here toward the lower pressure. That's one of the fundamental forces that will affect the horizontal motion of air. Secondly, and, and Frank alluded to this, well, let's, let's take a look at a graphic uh, situation first here, pressure gradient force. This is a map here of the isobars, and you can see with these isobars on here, we can very quickly visualize, well, we have an area of low pressure here. We have an area of high pressure down here. The pressure gradient force is uh, proportional to the pressure gradient. The word gradient means change with distance. How quickly is the pressure changing with distance? And we can look in this area right here, and see that that pressure is changing fairly quickly with distance because we have a fair number of isobars there. So we have a pressure gradient that's oriented from high pressure toward low pressure in this direction. And it's a fairly strong pressure gradient because our isobars are fairly close together. We also have a pressure gradient down here, high pressure toward low pressure, but notice the isobars are a lot farther apart. So that pressure gradient is weaker. So the difference between a strong pressure gradient and a weak pressure gradient. Okay, going on to look at other forces affecting the horizontal motion of air, we have what's called the Coriolis effect. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Coriolis force. It's not really a force. This is uh, a situation that arises because we live on a rotating sphere or a planet. And so Isaac Newton's laws of motion, which are fundamental to the understanding of meteorological motions, are valid in what's called an inertial or non-moving frame of reference. Okay? But our frame of reference, latitude and longitude, is moving, okay? So we have to account for that in large scale motions on the earth, whether it's motions of air or motions of artillery shells. Same thing, they're all subject to Coriolis effect. And without going into a long discussion of why it happens the way it is, let's accept, as they say in the courtroom, we're gonna stipulate some things here, <clears throat> ask you to believe. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force, or Coriolis effect rather, acts to the right of motion. In other words, if we have a motion going along, the rotation of the Earth is gonna cause that motion to deflect to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it'll be to the left. The initial direction of motion doesn't matter. In other words, whether the motion is toward the north, the south, the east, or the west, it's always gonna be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. The magnitude of the Coriolis effect is proportional to the speed of motion. The faster the motion of whatever it is, air, artillery shells, cars down the freeway, whatever it might be, is um, going to be deflected more if it's moving faster. And the Coriolis effect depends on latitude. And why is that? Because what we're really interested in, we're talking about a rotating sphere here, but what we're really interested in is what is the rotation about a local axis. So if we go to the North Pole and stick a pencil in the ground, we've got a lot of rotation around that axis of the North Pole. Go to the equator, stick the same pencil on the ground, and what happens? It goes around like this, but there's no rotation at all about a local axis. So at the uh, equator, that means that we have zero Coriolis effect, and it's at the maximum at the poles. So deflecting to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. And finally, friction. We all know what friction is. If you rub your feet along the carpet, you're gonna slow down a little bit. Same thing with air. And that gives rise to some of the turbulent flows that Frank was talking about. But in general, you're going to be looking at air rubbing against the surface of the Earth. It's going to slow it down, okay? And it's going to act in the opposite direction from the motion. The magnitude will depend on the nature of the surface. And Frank talked about initial conditions earlier. That's a big deal with initial conditions because the nature of the surface, whether it's a, a, a rough forest or a nice smooth icy lake, or uh, planes with grass on it, it's all gonna be different as far as friction. So parameterizing or, or, or quantifying friction is one of the more difficult things that happens in meteorology, especially in the development of meteorological models. So let's put all this stuff together in a, in a graphic way here. And if we start looking at a situation here and say that we're right here where this dot is, and this is a plan view here. So we've got north, south, east, west. 
and we've drawn some isobars on here, very straight isobars to make it simple. Uh, four millibars apart, which by the way is the standard on most US charts and other charts around the world as well. And if we say initially, let's say that we can stop motion, we have omnipotent powers and we can stop all the motion. If we do that, then we have only one of the three forces that we talked about in play, the pressure gradient force shown by the red arrow here, okay? Uh, if there's no motion, there's no Coriolis. Uh, if there's no motion, there's no friction, and, and for the moment, we'll ignore friction, okay? And now if we lose our omnipotent powers and take the brakes off the system and let it get going, okay, what's gonna happen? Well, this little dot here is gonna begin to move in this direction because of the pressure gradient force oriented from higher pressure toward lower pressure as shown by the isobars. Okay, so it begins to move after we take the brakes off. Well, as soon as it begins to move, now what do we have to deal with? Coriolis effect, we start to see a deflection in the northern hemisphere to the right. And so our resultant motion ends up being something that looks, this thing is gonna drive me nuts today, like this, okay. We've taken the brakes off now and we haven't fully realized the full magnitude of the pressure gradient force yet, so things keep going here. Moves a little faster, if it's gonna move a little faster, still have our pressure gradient force moving a little faster, what happens to the Coriolis deflection? It increases, and so we have a little bit more deflection at this point. We can keep going and do this until we find that we reach an equilibrium where the Coriolis effect just balances the uh, pressure gradient force and we end up with a flow directly parallel to the isobars. So we have pressure gradient force like this, Coriolis deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere, and things come into balance when the flow is right along the isobars. We call this the geostrophic approximation, okay? And it's a pretty good approximation of, of wind speed in the atmosphere. So there we go, there's, there's the, the graphic look at it. All these things are true about the geostrophic approximation. The air moves or the wind blows parallel to the isobars. Strength of the wind determined solely by the pressure gradient, how close those isobars are together, how strong is that pressure gradient. The Coriolis effect is, an, uh, is a result of the motion generated by the pressure gradient. So the spacing of the isobars will determine the geostrophic wind speed. The isobars are closer together, the wind speed will be higher and correspondingly, if they're farther apart, the wind speed will be less. Okay, now let's throw friction into the mix and see what happens, okay? Friction is gonna do what's gonna slow things down, okay? So we have friction uh, uh, acting in opposition to the motion. It's gonna slow things down. That's not gonna change the pressure gradient force because that's defined by our isobars here and their spacing, but it is gonna change the Coriolis deflection because remember the Coriolis deflection is proportional to the speed of motion. So if we slow the motion down, the Coriolis deflection is gonna be a little bit less. And we're gonna end up with something that looks a little bit more like this with a resultant motion, instead of exactly parallel to the isobars, across them toward lower pressure. And we can redo that so that we end up with that situation. Let me go back, no, no, never mind. okay. So, we come to Bayes Ballot's Law, and this Frank talked about the 1500s or so. Bayes Ballot is a Dutch meteorologist, that's the guy's name. And he came up with this law saying in the northern hemisphere, if you stand with your back to the wind, low pressure be found to your left and high pressure found to your right. And he got his name on that. Now today, you might look at that and say, well, gee, I could, I could make up a law and put my name on it and say that, that water flows downhill. It seems fairly fundamental. But keep in mind, at that time, there were no weather charts. Not all ships had barometers, and those that did, they were very expensive at that time. And so this was actually a fairly fundamental discovery by Bayes Ballot. And you can still use it today uh, to determine, for example, where is lower pressure with respect to your boat or your ship by knowing what the wind direction is. <clears throat> so to sum things up, if you have a chart with isobars, the orientation of the isobars will tell you the wind direction. Remember, across them a little bit toward lower pressure, keeping in mind Bayes Ballot's Law because the wind, uh, the, you can look at the isobars and say, well, if I stretch my left hand out, turn myself around, where is my left hand pointing toward low pressure? Okay, the wind's coming from my back and now cut it across the isobars toward low pressure and I have my wind direction. Spacing of the isobars will tell you the wind speed. There are some charts 
uh, that are produced around the world that have what's called the geostrophic wind scale right on the chart where you can take your dividers and measure the distance between two isobars and then take the dividers right up, put it on a scale and it'll read off the geostrophic wind speed. Now the actual wind speed is usually going to be a little bit less than that because geostrophic, remember, doesn't take account of friction. Uh, the British charts in particular have a geostrophic wind scale right on them and so you can do that very easily. So isobars will tell you wind speed and direction. Now we can use this to determine what is the circulation around pressure systems? And many of you probably already know this. You know that, for example, a low pressure system in the northern hemisphere circulates how? Counterclockwise, right. Well, let's see why, okay? We can do our same analysis here, pick a point around this low and say, okay, where's our pressure gradient force oriented from high to low pressure, always. So in this case, pointed toward the center of the low, northern hemisphere deflected to the right. There it goes. Geostrophic wind speed in that direction. We can do this in lots of locations around this low and we can keep doing it. There's our pressure gradient force, Coriolis deflection. There's our wind direction. And if we do this enough, we'll find that we find our circulation around the low is indeed counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. If you did it in the southern hemisphere, the uh, Coriolis effect would be opposite. It'd be to the left rather than to the right and you'd find that the circulation was opposite throw friction into the mix. What does friction do? Allows the wind to cut across the isobars toward lower pressure, and so we end up with a circulation around a center of low pressure in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise and inward toward the center when we account for friction. We can do the same analysis around highs. If we don't uh, look at friction first, we're going to find that the circulation around highs in the northern hemisphere is clockwise, and if we account for friction, it's going to be the same deal as before across the isobars toward lower pressure, which in this case is away from the center of the high. And so uh, clockwise around highs and slightly outward. We put 30 degree angle here. That's a very rough estimate and it's going to vary from place to place and from time to time. Again, depending on the nature of the surface because the nature of the surface is going to determine what the friction force is. Okay. So I've told you a bunch of stuff that you already knew probably, but now you know why. Building blocks, definitions, concepts. More definitions and concepts here. There's a whole bunch of them up here at once. I put them up all at once for a reason because I never know where to start with this. Uh, we talk about the uh, amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, which ends up being very important to a lot of physical processes that are going on in the atmosphere. And so we want to measure it. You guys probably measured it on board ship from time to time. And uh, there are a lot of different ways to quantify the amount of water in the gaseous phase or water vapor in the atmosphere. Let's look first at the definition of saturation. That's the situation where the atmosphere contains as much water vapor as possible at its current temperature. And the amount of water vapor that can be held in the atmosphere depends on temperature. Higher temperatures can hold more, lower temperatures hold less. Okay. The relative humidity, which you're used to hearing on the, on the television weather reports, is a ratio of actual water vapor content divided by saturation water vapor content. Remember the saturation water vapor content is a maximum number, okay? And so this ratio will have a value something between zero and one. And then we can express it as a percentage by multiplying by 100 because the numerator can never be higher than the denominator except for a few weird cases which we're not going to talk about, okay? <laughs> Uh, the dew point, temperature which air must be cooled to reach saturation. So if you have a certain amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, it's being held and then you lower the temperature. That means you're reducing the ability of the atmosphere to hold water vapor and eventually you're going to reduce it enough to the point where the water vapor that you have is as much as you can hold. And that's the dew point. And so fundamentally, if the dew point is a lot lower than the temperature, then that will tell you that there's not as much water vapor in the atmosphere at that point as there possibly could be and your relative humidity is going to be lower as well. Okay, so some definitions of uh, moisture in the atmosphere here. When air is saturated, we have as much water vapor as possible, the temperature and the dew point will be the same because you can't cool the air at all, you're at the dew point. And the relative humidity, that ratio that we just looked at, is 100%, meaning that the actual amount of water vapor is equal to the saturation amount of water vapor or the maximum amount that we could have. So air contains as much water vapor as possible at its current temperature building blocks we're still talking about here. Changes of state in water in the atmosphere. What do I mean by changes of state? 
you know, solid to liquid, liquid to gas. There are six of them, six changes of state. Freezing, which is liquid to solid. Melting, solid to liquid. Evaporation, liquid to gas. And condensation, gas to liquid. That's four of them. And then the others, sublimation and one of the deposition. <laughs> and those are uh, uh, changes of state from gas to solid or solid to gas without passing through the liquid phase, which does happen fairly commonly. Um, deposition, if you live in a northern climate, you have an implement in your automobile to take care of that, which is your ice scraper for your windshield. Frost on the windshield is not frozen dew. It's deposited directly from the gaseous phase to the solid phase on your windshield. So these, uh, all these transitions do occur commonly in the atmosphere. We, in particular, want to talk about today the process of condensation, which is the gas of the liquid phase. And during that process, heat is released from the water to the surrounding environment. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but just in general, the state of water when it's in the gaseous phase, it has more energy. And if we change it from the gaseous phase to the liquid phase, then some of the energy is taken away, and that energy comes out as heat. Okay? And so this process, when it occurs in the atmosphere, the process of condensation, it adds heat to the situation. The heat comes from the water and into the surrounding environment. We're not creating it out of whole cloth, as they say, but just the same, we are seeing a realization of it in the, in the atmosphere. Okay. And we call this, if the, my clicker will work here, latent heat of condensation. The term latent means hidden. In other words, there's heat there, but you can't necessarily see it. And actually, it's interesting because, well, no, I'll, I'll save that for, for the lunch break. <laughs> I've got to keep going here. Now we want to talk about vertical motion in the atmosphere. We've talked about wind. Wind is a horizontal movement of air in the atmosphere. But remember, at the outset, I said we want to talk about the idea that the atmosphere is three-dimensional. And so we have motions that are up and down in the atmosphere as well. And you guys are concerned about the horizontal motions in the atmosphere because that fills your sails and makes you go. But vertical motion in the atmosphere ends up being very important in terms of the development of weather systems. And so we want to talk about that uh, in at least a little bit of detail here. Okay. <clears throat> when air moves vertically in the atmosphere, it experiences a change in pressure. Remember the definition of pressure we started off with. So if we go to a higher level of the atmosphere, what happens to our pressure? It's going to decrease, right? Remember, definition of pressure is the force exerted by the column above a point. If I climb, if I have to go use the head during the break here and I climb up to the second floor, I'm leaving behind some chunk of that column of air, so my pressure necessarily force is going to be less when I go to higher levels. Okay? So it experiences a change in pressure when it, and it moves vertically. If it moves we can use the basic gas laws. You remember from high school chemistry, high school physics, uh, to relate a change in pressure to a change in temperature. Vertically moving air encounters higher pressure, it's going to become warmer. And if it encounters lower pressure, it will become colder. Thus, if air rising in the atmosphere, and therefore because of our definition of pressure encountering lower pressure, it's going to cool. And sinking air will turn warmer. So rising air cools, sinking air warms. As rising air cools, often it will cool to its dew point. And if we have additional cooling, then what's going to happen? Then we're going to begin to get some condensation. Okay. Think of it as development of clouds. Rising air will lead to the development of clouds. If you fly on an airplane uh, through a cloud deck, you'll often feel, a commercial airliner, you'll feel it start to get a little bumpy as you're going through that cloud deck. It's not because the clouds have any mass that's very much different than the air around them. It's because in that cloud area, there are upward currents of air going on, which produces the clouds. Okay. <clears throat> So we see development of clouds and eventually precipitation. So this upward motion is something that we're pretty interested in. Two ways that vertical motion will be initiated. First is forced vertical motion. That's going to be produced by terrain. You've got plenty of that around here. Uh, fronts and some other three-dimensional forces that uh, occur in the atmosphere. And then atmospheric instability. We'll talk more about fronts in just a minute. Atmospheric instability depends on the vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere. We don't have time to to visit this in a lot of detail today. But 
any situation will be deemed unstable whenever the lifted air from an area is, ends up cooler than the air. Uh, it's going to be cool as it's lifted. If it ends up warmer than the air already at the level that it reaches, then it's going to be more buoyant and it's going to keep going. Okay. So when the atmosphere is unstable, unforced vertical motions are more likely to occur. Okay. So when might that happen? Oh, sorry. When the existing temperature profile features temperatures dropping more quickly with height than a certain benchmark. Okay. So if low levels are relatively warm or if upper levels are relatively cold, you're going to see this instability develop, vertical motion more likely. So if you think of it in certain areas where thunderstorms are common, when do those thunderstorms occur? Mostly in the afternoon and evening, absent some other system coming through. And that's because the ground heats up during the day, so the low levels are warming up. It makes things more unstable. Now we see the uh, unforced vertical motions beginning to occur, and if there's enough uh, moisture present, uh, you'll see condensation beginning to occur in the development of clouds. Okay. Or if upper levels are relatively cold, sometimes you'll hear a situation, a weather forecaster talk about, well, an upper disturbance is coming through the area, and so we're going to see some clouds developing today, maybe have a shower of rain or snow or something of that nature. That's what it is, it's a pocket of colder air at upper levels coming across the area, perhaps not associated with any particular storm system. Also, when the relative humidity of low and middle levels is high, in other words, there's a lot of moisture available in the low and middle levels, if that air is, is forced to rise, then you get condensation fairly quickly, latent heat of condensation, so you're adding heat. This relative humidity adds heat to the low levels and adds to the instability. So instability will lead to the development of cumulus clouds on sunny afternoons, and if it's unstable enough, cumulonimbus clouds, meaning thunderstorm clouds, and instability in combination with force lifting can produce more violent weather. So if you've got a front moving through and you have instability ahead of that front, that's when you can start to talk about some really violent weather, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and the like. <clears throat> Definitions and concepts. One final one we're going to hit here. Definition of convergence and divergence. Fairly uh, straightforward. Convergent flow, divergent flow. Flow coming together is convergent. Flow moving apart is divergent. In the atmosphere, we very rarely see flows that look like this, but we do see flows that look like that. And let's, and let me go back there. Ah, goodness. You get the picture. <laughs> Airflow may not be coming directly together, but if there's some component of it that's flowing together, it's convergent. And then we have to again get back to our three-dimensional idea here. In other words, looking at a situation where we have divergence at upper levels and convergence at the surface. What happens? Well, okay, well, the surface convergence is coming together. You've got airflow coming together. Where's it going to go? It's got no place to go but up. And if you have upper level divergence upstairs, airflow coming apart. And so you have this couplet that shows up. And you end up with rising motion here. We already talked about what's going to happen with rising motion. Why are we interested in that? Because it may lead to condensation. Uh, development of clouds, precipitation, release of latent heat, adding energy to systems, things of that nature. Okay. So a combination of upper level divergence, surface convergence, ask the question, what happens to the surface pressure in this situation? Okay. Typically, and, and keep in mind that typically at upper levels, the wind speeds are going to be stronger. Okay. And so what are we doing here? Remember our definition of pressure, weight of the column above a point. What are we doing downstairs here? Well, we're, we're shoveling stuff into the bottom of the column. That's going to increase the weight of the column, right? Okay. But what are we doing upstairs? We're pulling stuff out. And because the wind speeds are stronger upstairs, we're pulling more stuff out upstairs than we're putting in downstairs. And so the net result here is going to be, with time, a decrease in the surface pressure. Okay. If we look at the opposite situation, we're going to be looking at upper level convergence, surface divergence. Here we're pulling stuff out of the column at the surface but we're shoveling more stuff in at the top than we're pulling out at the bottom. And so this situation of upper level convergence surface divergence is going to lead to increasing the weight of the column of air in that area and an increase in surface pressure along with downward motion. Downward motion, remember, is not going to be a situation that's going to lead to any development of clouds because the motion is, the air is coming down and it's warming up. If we're warming the air up, what's going to happen to the relative humidity? It's going to go down. <clears throat> 
Okay. And look at uh, general circulation of the atmosphere here, very briefly actually. And we're talking about what we call the three cell model. Frank talked about this early on, the, the difference in uh, heat, incoming energy, incoming solar radiation, a, an excess of it in the lower latitudes, and a deficit of it in the higher latitudes. And if we don't have something to change that, as Frank mentioned, you're going to see it get hotter and hotter and hotter at the equator, colder and colder and colder at the poles. Well, we have something that will help redistribute that energy. We have two, two methods, actually. One is motions of the fluid in the atmosphere, which is what we call the air, and the other is motion of fluid in the oceans. So we try to develop a general circulation model for the atmosphere that helps to alleviate this imbalance of energy at the lower latitudes versus the higher latitudes. And we come up with this three cell model. <clears throat> and without going into a lot of detail about how we got here, generally in the three cell model we see a belt of low pressure. And by the way, for this initially we make an assumption here. We make an assumption that the Earth is not tilted on its axis. We make an assumption that there is no land or oceans. It's a very uniform, bland surface with no friction. And, uh, and also that we have uh, uh, no rotation. Well, no, we'll have the rotation, okay? So, but we end up with a belt of, of low pressure at the equator, which we call the intertropical convergence zone. Some of you may have sailed across that at one time or another. In the 30 degree north and south area, we have a belt of high pressure in this theoretical model we call subtropical high pressure. Subpolar low pressure is 60 degrees north and south and high pressure at the poles. Okay. Now we can take this and we can say, well, what's the wind going to be in these areas? These belts of pressure will give rise to zones of wind. So we can say, what's going to happen here? The air will flow from high pressure toward low pressure. That's on a very large scale, your pressure gradient force. And then we have to take into effect the Coriolis effect. So if we look at this uh, area right here, we would see air flowing from the subtropical high pressure toward the intertropical convergence zone, then deflecting to the right in the northern hemisphere. And we're going to end up with a wind flow that looks something like that, which we call our northeast trade winds. Get up into the mid-latitudes. Again, pressure gradient force acting in this direction, deflected to the right. And we find our prevailing westerlies. And if we keep going, uh, we'll find our polar easterlies. And we see the same thing in the southern hemisphere, except keeping in mind that the Coriolis deflection is opposite. So we have northeast trade winds, southeast trade winds, prevailing westerly, polar easterly. So this diagram right here tells you in a long-term average here, not day-to-day -day necessarily, but in a long-term average, what am I going to find for wind conditions across the atmosphere? And part of this is uh, uh, the development of uh, a general circulation model and, and sailing directions that were developed eventually for ships, uh, especially in the age of sail. And they knew that these trade winds, the, the name trade winds was, had to do with trade, commerce, that the sailors could rely on these winds in these latitudes. These are the most consistent of all these winds, are the trade winds, both in the northern and southern hemisphere. Another graphic here looking at this, which is much better than I can draw, stolen from a textbook, but you see the same thing here. Equatorial lower intertropical convergence zone, sometimes called the doldrums. Northeast trade winds here in the Equatorial and subtropical latitudes, also in the southern hemisphere. Subtropical high in the northern hemisphere called the horse latitudes. Everybody familiar with that term? Okay. And your polar high, a dome of cold air here at the poles producing easily. So this is a nicer picture, but you get the, it's the same general idea. We have these circulation cells here that are three-dimensional in nature. We're not going to go into the three-dimensionality of it today for lack of time. So there's our, our theoretical three-cell model. And it works pretty well most of the time, but not all the time. There are going to be some areas where it doesn't hold up necessarily, but it's a, a reasonable start. So here's a look at a chart showing mean pressure and wind circulation over the entire month of January, average over many years. Okay? This is not a daily weather map. Okay? But we can see on this, if we look at this and look at long-term averages, we can see some of the features that we just looked at in the theoretical model. Here's the intertropical convergence zone. It's not right along the equator. It varies from place to place, and that's because one of the assumptions that we made in putting together the model was that we had no land and no ocean. Well, we have land and oceans, and there, so there are differences in how the land and the ocean absorbs and then re-radiates incoming solar energy, so we have some temperature differences that show up there, which lead to these variations in these features here. Here's our subtropical highs. We notice that it's not a consistent belt of high pressure, but rather you see cells over the oceans because the land gets warmer here and the pressure gets a little bit lower over the, over the warmer land. But we can see very clearly right in through here. Keep in mind, this is long-term averages. This doesn't say that on January 
3rd, 2020, that we're going to have a high pressure center right here. But rather, if we average all the data that we have over a number of years for the whole month of January, we come up with this particular chart. Our subtropical highs are showing up here in the northern hemisphere as well. Get into the mid, in, in this area here, our subtropical lows, our polar front lows, Aleutian low here, Icelandic low here. Here's something that doesn't fit Siberian high. Why is that there? Because that, again, factors back into the idea that we made an assumption that there was no difference in the surface of the Earth over the whole Earth. There we have a, a massive amount of land, and during the wintertime season, northern hemisphere in January, that land is able to get a lot colder. Colder air is denser, it's heavier, so you're going to see high pressure develop over the land areas. Okay, so that's a difference. Southern hemisphere, we don't see any subpolar lows down here. Any idea why that is? It's a difference between hemispheres. What's, what's the very nature of the difference of the, of the planet in this area versus at the northern hemisphere in the same latitudes? There's no land down there. Um, this is summer down here. That's absolutely correct. But it doesn't mean there are no lows down here at this time of the year. Keep in mind what this is. This is a mean pressure and wind circulation. Okay? So it's an average long term. There are plenty of lows that track down through here in the month of January. But they're no more likely at any given longitude than any other longitude, as opposed to the northern hemisphere where they are more likely where the temperatures in the wintertime are a little bit warmer, which is over the oceans. And so they're going to get averaged out in the southern hemisphere. And so we'll see, as a matter of fact, as we go to the July situation here, same chart except for July, we still don't see any lows down here, even though there's, we know they're there. Anybody who's done any sailing in the Southern Ocean or heard about people who've done any sailing, you know they're there. They're screaming, you know, the, the roaring 40s and the screaming 50s. But they're all averaged out when you average over the entire month of July. What else do we notice? Differences here. This is northern hemisphere summer. The intertropical convergence zone has shifted north. That's, remember, our estimation or our uh, uh, assumption was that the, atmosphere, the uh, Earth's axis was not tilted. We know the Earth's axis is tilted. And so the maximum solar radiation shifts with the seasons, and that allows these features to shift as well. Here's our subtropical highs still here in the southern hemisphere. Now in southern hemisphere winter, we see a high over Australia rather than over the oceans here. That's the difference in land and ocean. Northern hemisphere have our Bermuda high here. That's a subtropical high. Our Aleutians high is gone. Doesn't mean there are never any lows there, but they're much less strong at that time of the year. Still have a very weak Icelandic low that has shifted actually west up here into the, uh, the waters west of Greenland. And we see a low here. This doesn't fit with the uh, three cell model, low pressure in these latitudes. That's a thermal low. Again, land ocean differences. So that's the real world. Okay. Okay. We're going to talk now about weather systems to some extent. How am I doing for time? Am I okay? okay. Uh, and first, we want to do that. We want to talk about scales of systems here. And Frank talked a little bit about this in terms of time scales, but also in terms of, of uh, distance scales. And we talk about four scales, planetary, synoptic, mesoscale, microscale. Microscale stuff is the really small stuff which has a, a spatial scale of a kilometer or less uh, time scale, or in other words, how long does it last? Maybe a few minutes, maybe an hour in some cases. And you're talking in this case about individual thunderstorms, tornadoes. Dust devils that you see come across the baseball infield on some day or whatever. Even gustiness in the wind, a microscale feature. Mesoscale features are a little bit bigger. Squall lines, MCC mesoscale convective complex. That may last for several hours. Get into the synoptic scale. Synoptic scale is often called weather map scale. These are the features that you're used to seeing on your television news report or that you're looking at on a, a uh, oceanic uh, surface analysis chart. Highs, lows, fronts. Um, short waves in the jet stream, we'll talk about that. And these have uh, spatial scales of hundreds of kilometers and uh, time scales of several days. You can watch a system, for example, in, out in the Pacific work its way east toward the northwestern United States and then come in from there and continue on eastward from there. So you can follow it. Planetary or global scale, these are the semi-permanent oceanic highs that are very large and long waves in the jet stream, thousands of kilometers and several weeks. Most of the, of the Features that you're going to see on ocean charts are going to fall into the synoptic scale range. But not that you won't see mesoscale features from time to time. Microscale features, are you going to be worried about those on your boat? Yep. A water spout could be a problem for you. Um, so you're going to want to have to watch that as well. 
So fronts. Definition of a front, a boundary between dissimilar air masses. Just a boundary. Oops, I went too fast. Okay, a boundary between air masses that have different densities. Think water and oil or molasses and water or something of that nature. In most cases, fronts move, the air masses involved are moving as well. Name of the front, for, in some cases, will give an indication of the air mass which is moving into a region. In effect, the front is the leading edge of the new air mass. The term actually has military origins. You're talking about the front in the, in the military, you're talking about the leading edge of troops. In meteorology, you're talking about the front as being a leading edge of an air mass. Okay? So in terms of a cold front, we're talking about the cold front being the leading edge of a cold air mass. Cold air replacing warmer air at the surface, okay? And so if you're in one place and a cold front passes, you remember the front is just the boundary, that's all. You're seeing a colder air mass moving in. The colder air is denser by definition. As it advances, it wedges underneath warmer and less dense air ahead of the front. It's gonna force that warmer air to rise. This is the forced vertical motion we talked about earlier, okay? And depending on the moisture content of the warm air, in other words, how high is the dew point of the relative humidity, and the stability or instability, then you may see some showers and thunder showers. If you have a dramatic difference between the two air masses involved, in other words, the cold air mass is a lot colder than the warm air mass, and when moisture levels are high in the warm air, then you can get severe thunderstorms and sometimes tornadoes in extreme cases. Cold fronts tend to be the more violent fronts, okay? And this is a very simplified diagram of what we're talking about here. This is a vertical diagram. Here's the surface of the earth, and then we're going up and we're seeing this cold air mass moving in here, advancing in the direction of the arrow here, wedging underneath the warm air, forcing it to rise. The vertical scale is greatly exaggerated here, so you can see what's going on. And we have another, oops, excuse me, little diagram here where we see a little animation here. Again, 100 kilometers here, five kilometers here. Here's the cold air coming along, forcing the air to rise, rises to uh, some certain point, reaches its dew point, now we see the development of clouds and precipitation. If everything continues to go on and the atmosphere is unstable enough, then we'll see the development of some showers and thunder showers. Okay. Warm front, and unlike a cold front, it has to do with uh, warm air replacing colder air at the surface. Warmer air advances, it's gonna ride up gradually over the colder, denser air ahead of the front. Clouds develop large areas, steady precipitation frequently results. Because of the more gradual motion, the clouds tend to be more layered in nature, and so we don't see the, the vertically developed clouds that we see in the case of a cold front, but rather more stratiform clouds, but still you're gonna end up seeing precipitation. Usually in the area of steady precipitation rather than the showery or violent precipitation with a cold front. And this is important here, the cloud sequence associated with an approaching warm front, one of the most reliable weather indicators that you can observe without instruments. In other words, you can look at it with your eyes and see it. Because well ahead of the warm front, you're gonna see high, thin cirrus clouds, mackerel, sky, mares, tails, whatever you wanna call them. And then with time, if that front is approaching, you'll see that cloud layer lowering, thickening, and eventually precipitation shows up. Again, warm air advancing. The slope of this front is much more gradual than that of a cold front, so you just have this air riding up along the colder, denser air, and you're gonna get your clouds developing. So way out here, you're gonna see your cirrus clouds proceed to your cirrostratus, altostratus, uh, nimbostratus, stratus clouds as you get closer to the front, and that's where the rain is gonna be. And again, we have a, an animation here. This animation would be a little bit better if it showed the front moving as well, but the air moving along the front, riding up, and you're getting your clouds developing here. Precipitation will show up in here eventually. There it is. Um, and so when this is well developed here, here at point B and you're just beginning to see those high thin clouds if the front advances toward your position then you're going to see the clouds lowering and thickening with time and eventually the development of precipitation. Again the vertical scale here very uh, exaggerated. Occluded fronts. This occurs when a uh, cold front overtakes a warm front. Okay. Three air masses involved. We've got cold air behind the cold front, cold air ahead of the warm front and between the two fronts a warm air mass. The fronts come together, that warm air mass is bodily lifted right off the surface, okay? Initially, that's gonna mean some heavy precipitation, but as the process continues, that precipitation becomes lighter, more intermittent. Basically, what we're doing is we're grabbing that air, we're lifting it pretty quickly, and so we're gonna quickly realize the, the condensation and development of precipitation. With time, after a while, if we lift it high enough, 
we're going to wring out most of the moisture and there's just not going to be that much left. Okay. <clears throat> so occluded front. Again, let's look at the diagram here. Okay. Two types of occluded fronts, cold occlusion. This has to do with which of the cold air masses is colder, uh, and you can read the text here. More recent research suggests that cold occlusions are not very common, and some question whether they occur at all. But here we have a situation, cold front and warm front still separate and distinct. Here's the cold front. Remember, it's just the boundary here. Here's the warm front. Cold air mass, cold air mass, warm air mass in between. Cold air advancing more quickly, which is usually the case. The cold front overtakes the warm front, occluded front results and the two types showing up here, cold occlusion and warm occlusion. Both cases, what do you notice? That that warm air is no longer at the surface. So if you're at the surface, you're never going to see the warm air mass. You're going to go from one cold air mass into another one. The temperature change generally is not going to be as great as if it were a cold front or a warm front. Okay. Stationary fronts, still a boundary between two, two air masses. It's just not moving. Typically, no dramatic weather. Uh, but you can still have overcast conditions, some precipitation, because you're going to get some rising air in the vicinity of the front. Sometimes the front can stay stationary for a long time, but sometimes it's rather short. Uh, and if it sits in one place for many days, then the precipitation amounts can become quite significant over time, even if it's not raining that heavily at any given time. And stationary fronts, and this is where we're going to go next, this is where mid-latitude low pressure systems often begin to develop. A boundary between a cold polar air mass and a warm tropical air mass, and we'll take a look at the life cycle of a typical mid-latitude low. And we're going to run through this very quickly. Apologies ahead of time. Here we have a situation. Again, plan view here, north, south, east, west. Here's a stationary front right here. Warmer air mass here, colder air mass here. Isobar is drawn here. The front lies in what we call a trough of low pressure. So the pressure is lowest along the front here. Right here, we would see if you did your bias balance all, you'd find you had northeast winds up through here and southwest winds down here. So 180 degree wind shift across the stationary front. Okay. So something comes along and causes the pressure along this front to become a little bit lower in one spot. So with time, we may end up seeing something like this. We get a, a little bit of low pressure along one portion of the front. That distorts the isobaric pattern and starts the air masses moving a little bit. The colder air mass begins to push farther south, and this becomes a cold front because it's now advancing, it's moving, and we see the warmer air coming up through here. We develop a little bit of a rotary circulation here, so instead of seeing just that 180 degree shift across the frontal boundary, now we're seeing more of a rotary circulation around this particular low, and if conditions remain uh, favorable for this thing to develop, the pressure gets lower and lower, and then with time we end up with something that looks like this, a well-developed mid-latitude low, northern hemisphere here with a cold front extending off to its south-southwest, a warm front extending off to its east. Steady precipitation ahead of the warm front, as we looked at when we looked at the definition structure of the front earlier, and a band of showery precipitation, perhaps thunder showers, along the cold front. The warm air mass here is punching up into the colder air mass, while the colder air mass uh, hangs tough up in this area and also surges around to the back side of the thing right here. And then with time, the cold front will swing around and catch up, and we get the development of an occluded front in through here. And our warm sector, as we call it here, where the warm air mass is, is now removed from the center. Again, steady precipitation showing up down here, showery precipitation along the cold front, and precipitation back near the low becoming lighter and more intermittent as that occluded front exists for a longer period of time, and that air is lifted, and you begin to see things change. Here's a, uh, a diagram without any isobars, just showing the placement of the air masses. Low pressure here. Uh, warm front extending off to the east, cold front extending off to the south, southwest, northern hemisphere, warm moist air. And you can imagine, if you think about it in three dimensions here, this warm moist air coming up here and coming right up out of the screen and being lifted over the cooler air here and leading to the uh, rising air condensation development of clouds and precipitation and this colder air wedging underneath and forcing this warm air to rise here, leading to a band of showers and thunder showers. Structure of the mid-latitude low. So basically that wedge of warm air we call the warm sector. It's between the cold front and the warm front. Usually when that warm front and cold front are nearly at right angles, system nearing its uh, peak intensity, and precipitation patterns with the fronts are well established as we talked about the fronts. Cold front rotates around the southern end of the low. It will catch up to the warm front, and the occlusion process will begin. Weakening of the low often begins after the occlusion process is underway. This is... Uh, the point where the, the three fronts meet we call the triple point. 
conditions are right, a new low, sometimes called a secondary low, can develop in that location. <clears throat> sometimes that secondary low can become stronger than the original low, and they frequently develop off the Carolina coast in the eastern United States, known there as Hatteras lows. If no secondary low develops, then gradual weakening is going to occur as that warm air mass is lifted off the surface, leaving little contrast in the air mass at the surface, and the low will either dissipate or may continue as a well-developed circulation but not be very dynamic. And this uh, theory of the mid-latitude low was developed by Frank's uh, friends in, in the Norwegian school, as they call it, in the early 1900s, uh, called the frontal low or the mid-latitude low or the wave cyclone, all names like that. And it's held up pretty well over more than 100 years now, uh, and, which is amazing because keeping in mind that in the early 1900s, they didn't have the observation ability that we have now. There were no satellite, no radar. Uh, there weren't as many surface observations, and so, but they figured it out. Circulation around the low, counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, slightly inward. Precipitation patterns shown here. Large area, steady precipitation, band of showers and thunder showers around the low. The fronts lie in what we call a trough of low pressure, and that leads to a distortion of the isobars uh, pointing away from the low center. We can see it very clearly here and to a lesser extent over here. And if we have these sharp uh, kinks in the isobars here along the front, what's that going to mean when the front passes you in terms of wind? It's gonna mean you're going to see a sudden shift in wind direction because of the change, sudden change in the orientation of the isobars. Precipitation showing here, as we just mentioned, isolated showers in the warm sector. <clears throat> Again, look across this line here, you see the fronts, the cold air, the warm air, the cloud sequence with the warm front, the thunderstorms with the cold front, and across here, no fronts, but we see the colder air uh, being a little bit more shallow right near the low and deeper back in the, well into the cold air masses. The wind patterns, we talked about that, sudden shift of winds at the fronts, especially the cold front. Movement of mid-latitude lows, mainly controlled by upper level wind patterns, meaning the 500 millibar, we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Upper patterns sometimes lead to a generally west-east motion across the oceans, but at other times a significant south to north component will show up. Understanding 500 millibars will help you with this. We'll talk about more of that. Why do we care about that? Well, let's take a look at this out here in the Pacific. And we, we look at a mid-latitude low that's sitting out here somewhere north of Hawaii. And we're sitting here along, somewhere along the northwestern U.S. coast. Why do we care how this thing is going to move? Because it's going to end up being very different. If this thing comes up here like this, not much impact here, right? On the other hand, if it comes a little bit closer and it's strong, that may lead to a strong onshore wind here over the northwestern U.S. And everybody in the northwestern U.S. knows what that means big swells, right? Frank will talk more about that. On the other hand, if it comes in here and heads into northern California and stays to the south, knowing the circulation patterns around the mid-latitude low, that means some sort of easterly wind direction, which is a very different situation, okay? If we have a low out here, if it's going up in that direction, pretty far away, maybe we're not so concerned about it, but if it's heading right at, at uh, the entrance to the Straits of Juan de Fuca, maybe we care a little bit more about it. Got a low up here over the uh, outer Aleutians, Heading up in that direction, don't really care about it. On the other hand, coming over here like that, depending on its strength, we may be more concerned about it. We're certainly going to be concerned about it if it's coming like that. So we care how these things move. Okay. So 500 millibar dynamics, which we'll talk about. But if, but if you have a basic understanding of the structure of the mid-latitude low and the structure of fronts, then you can do some basic short-term forecasting. And this involves paying attention, basically. Compare your present weather conditions with your understanding. It'll give you an indication of where you are with respect to the low. What's your wind speed and direction? Southwest or northeast? Where's the low going to be with respect to you if, if the wind is in that direction? What's your temperature? Are you likely in a warmer, uh, warmer side of the low or the colder side of the low? What's the cloud cover like? Have you got that warm frontal cloud sequence beginning, or are you seeing more um, instability clouds that might indicate you'd be in the warm sector of the low. Are you getting any precipitation? Okay. And then once you know where you are, you want to watch the trends. Meteorology in a lot of cases is about trends and change. So we're going to look at all these things. Do we have that classic warm frontal cloud sequence underway? In other words, are the clouds changing to the way that you would say that we have a warm front off in the distance and it's nearing our position? What about our barometer? Is our pressure getting higher or getting lower? That's a really good indication. Is you got low pressure coming toward you? How fast is your barometer falling or not? 
How fast is it rising? What about the wind? Is the wind direction backing or veering? Backing is a counterclockwise wind shift in the northern hemisphere. Veering is a clockwise wind shift. That's going to tell you whether your front might be approaching or moving away from your area. Is your temperature rising or falling? Have you had a cold front pass and seeing the temperature drop? Are you seeing the temperature rise with the approach of a warm front? All these things are going to help out. Again, understanding the circulation of the mid-latitude low is going to help you determine that. If you're sitting out here, you got a southwest wind at 15 knots, let's say. Okay, what's happening with time? Is that wind becoming stronger with time? That may say the low's moving in this direction. You're going to see a cold frontal passage after a while. Is the wind not changing very much at all? Maybe the low's moving up in this direction, and you're just going to come down here and, and continue to see nice sailing weather. Um, what are the clouds doing? Are you seeing increasing amounts of cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds indicating perhaps you're getting closer to that cold front and it's advancing toward your position? What if you're up here? Is the wind veering or backing? Is it veering, in other words, shifting from uh, northeast here more toward easterly with time, meaning that warm front might be approaching at the same time you're seeing air clouds lower and thicken and you're starting to see some precipitation and your barometer is falling. All these things are things that you can observe. So understanding the structure of this mid-latitude low uh, can be very important for you. Triple point is right here where the three fronts meet. That's where we can get secondary low development. Okay. So could get a low developing here with time. At a later time, maybe the isobars start to look like this and the fronts. <clears throat> we can see the new low. And sometimes that secondary low can very shortly become stronger than the primary low was. This can mean unexpected shifts in wind direction. The low develops quickly, rapid increases in wind speeds. Here's a chart from uh, late January this year. We've got a low sitting out here. This is a surface uh, forecast chart. Low pressure sitting out here with an occluded front extending down in this direction. Here's our triple point right here. And the forecaster, Mr. Nolt, is telling us in this chart that we're going to have a new low developing from this triple point moving up here. And the low 24 hours subsequent to the valid time of this chart is going to be located here. Okay? So there's an example of where a triple point low could develop. Okay? Uh, I want to expand a little bit. As I said, the Norwegian cyclone model has held together pretty well over a large number of years. But more recent research, uh, observational research as well, has been able to identify some new types of ocean lows that are stronger. And the process of occlusion is thought of a little bit differently. We talk about an, a, an occluded front forming by a low, a uh, cold front rather, catching up to a warm front. But there are some thoughts that the process may be more of a wrap up than catch up situation. In other words, the circulation around the low sort of wrapping up like a window shade to, to some extent. So if you have a situation here, we've got a, a low with some isobars, a warm front and a cold front at a later time, you can sort of envision this thing sort of wrapping up a little bit, the, the warm air being pulled around and everything being pulled around. And then at a later time, you may have something that shows up looking like that so that it's, it hasn't really caught up necessarily, but it's become wrapped up in the circulation. The occlusion still means that you're seeing that warm air being lifted off the surface, but the process formation is a little bit different, wrap up instead of catch up. And this gives us rise to talking about the Kaiser Shapiro low. It's a newer model which fits better with some stronger ocean lows. And we have the technology now to look at these and determine what's going on with these systems. And so you end up seeing, this doesn't at all invalidate the Norwegian model, but it just adds to it to a certain extent. So Sometimes we see what's called a frontal fracture, meaning the cold air breaks off and rushes east but leaves behind a little bit of warm air. And we see this called so-called bent back warm front. And then this T-bone feature here, we have a bent back occluded front. And then sometimes here you see this, this thing curling around like that. So I put this up just so that if you see these features on a chart, you know that hey, the, the, the meteorologist didn't screw it up. He's looking at something a little bit different. And I have a couple of charts here to go through to show this. This is a, a surface analysis chart from the 23rd of January. And we have a nice little Kaiser Shapiro low right here. Uh, here's Hawaii down here. And so this thing's sitting right here. And a pretty tight pressure gradient here. And notice here, hurricane force. That's the warning. Three warning categories on the charts. Gale, storm, hurricane force. Look them up online. Know what they are. Okay. So here we have a Kaiser Shapiro low right here. This is a 12 UTC on the 23rd of January. A little bit of zooming in there so you can see it, this bent back occluded front circulating around the thing, triple point out here. <clears throat> Six hours later, notice how the occluded front has wrapped around this guy right here. 
And you've got this, this situation right here. So it's a fairly strong low, still a hurricane force low. Again, zooming in to see it. And I put these little green boxes on this chart because this corresponds to a, uh, a satellite imaging system that allows us to see winds on the surface of the ocean. It's called ASCAT. Do a Google search for it, A-S-C-A-T. Did I get that right? <laughs> okay. This, this is like dropping a thousand buoys out on the water. It's a t powerful observational tool. It's a polar orbiting satellite, so it only sees a small slice of the atmosphere at any given time, but it's very powerful if you get lucky. And we got lucky with this system and had two images that looked like this where this low was located, located right here. And you can see the winds, the scale here, you're out here. And so the stronger winds are just outside of that occluded front or ahead of that occluded front on this particular low. And you can see what we're looking at here. So this is a very, this is a, a new observational tool that's very helpful in determining things. Satellite picture at the, at the 1200 UTC chart, looking at that low, we can see it right in here. You can very clearly see things here, okay? You can sort of see that front six hours later. Put this and burn this into your brain for a minute. You can see the wrapping around six hours later, that system. 24-hour forecast shows the system. We only have a 24-hour forecast for the Eastern Pacific, so we can't see the whole thing, but it's moved off in this direction here. Still a fairly strong system, although perhaps weakening at that time. Okay. Upper level analysis. Um, when we did this a year and a half ago, this would be where I would have sat down, and my friend Lee Chesnell would have stood up, started talking about 500 millibars, and uh, as Frank said, uh, Lee is why we're here in some cases because he was really passionate about uh, educating mariners and, and having people be self-reliant. Uh, sometimes so passionate that some of us around him had to calm him down a little bit and say, look, Lee, we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, Lee got me into to doing some of this education stuff close to 20 years ago now. Um, and so I want to I tip my hat again to him and uh, I'm going to hold up this, this uh, book right here called Concepts and Applications, 500 Millibar Charts, author uh, Lee Chesno and Captain Ma Lee Chen, uh, Hong Kong, I think, um, who uh, did an awful lot of work looking at 500 Millibar Charts. <laughs> and uh, you can get them on Amazon, I think, and Lee is here in the back. Maybe he has some too. We'll see. But at any rate, weather is three-dimensional. This is what we talked about earlier, okay? And I have this picture that I stole from a paper. Uh, written by my friend Lee Chesno and also by Joe Sinkowitz uh, from the Ocean Prediction Center, who you'll hear from in a little bit. And I'm not going to talk in any great detail, but you can look at this and see this is really hard to, to conceptualize what's going on in three dimensions here. So we have to sort of figure out how to do that. Uh, Mariner's Guide to the 500 Millibar Chart. You can find it on the Ocean Prediction Center website. That's the title of the paper. It was written originally in, uh, I'm trying to remember the year, 2000 and one or something, 96, I think, and then, and then redone several years later, really with very little change in the, in the content, but changes in the graphics like this that, that weren't available for the earlier paper. I commend you to read it. Um, you'll have to read it more than once. It's not light bedtime reading, um, <laughs> but it is, if you can look at it, it's, it's uh, very helpful. Written for mariners. <clears throat> okay. Temperatures in general turn colder, moving from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. The equator is warmer than the poles, okay? Pressure drops with height. As one goes up in the atmosphere, if the air is denser or colder, the pressure will fall more quickly. Definition of pressure. If we go up in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is colder, then you're leaving more mass behind more quickly, and so the pressure will fall faster and colder than it will in warmer air. If the entire column of air is colder, then the horizontal pressure difference will accumulate with height compared to a column of warmer air. So, generally when temperatures turn colder with higher latitude and upper levels, the pressure gradient will become stronger and be oriented from lower latitudes toward higher latitudes. As the pressure gradient becomes stronger, the wind speeds will become higher. Strongest winds at upper levels occur where the temperature gradient is strongest, is where this temperature gradient is strongest, so we expect mid-latitude loads to develop. Got all that? <laughs> Here's a picture. So here we are in the lower latitudes. The pressure, again, falls. Uh, less quickly in warmer air than it does in colder air. So if we look here, down here near the equator, we see the pressure dropping as we go up in the atmosphere. Here in the higher latitudes, it's dropping more quickly. So if we take a slice at some upper level, we're going to find that we have a fairly significant pressure gradient. Remember, pressure gradient force acts from 
higher pressure toward lower pressure. So if we slice through here, our pressure gradient force in this simplified situation, assuming that the temperature gradient is, is uniform everywhere, is acting from the lower latitudes toward the higher latitudes. We have our Coriolis deflection, so we have a strong westerly wind at this particular level. Okay. What don't we have in our wind situation at upper levels that we talked about at the surface? Friction, meaning that the geostrophic approximation once we leave the surface is actually pretty good, particularly at, at upper levels. Um, and so we can look at the spacing between isobars as a very good indication of what the wind speed is going to be at upper levels. Okay. So in this particular simplified situation, wind flow directly from the west, no significant divergence or convergence. Wind speeds are a bit stronger when the orientation of the curve flow is anticyclonic compared with cyclonically curved flow. What does that mean? Cyclonically curved flow is flow as about low pressure. So you have, at upper levels, we often don't have closed circulation centers. We have waves in the flow. Okay? And so if you take a situation where the, the curvature is oriented in one direction, if you complete the circle, so to speak, if you complete it and you see in the northern hemisphere counterclockwise circula circulation, that's uh, cyclonically curved flow. Anticyclonically is as about high pressure. So here's a little diagram showing just a, a little wave field that you sometimes might see at upper levels. And we're not going to go into the reasons why today, but you, you're going to have to take my word for this just on a time, that the wind speed is a little bit faster here around the anticyclonic flow. And again, if you complete the circle here, you're going to see a clockwise circulation here as about high pressure. This is anticyclonic. Here it's cyclonic. Complete the circle, and it's counterclockwise. The regions where the, the orientation of the curvature changes are these boxes here, the green and, and the blue, uh, blue and green box, OK? And so basically, what does this mean? If we have a situation here where the isobars at a given level are all the same distance apart, in other words, the wind speed, geostrophic wind speed would all be the same, but because at upper levels we have a, a slight change in that because of the curvature, then we're going to see in this blue box here more air entering the region than leaving because the wind speed is faster here, slower here, so we're potting up air there. That's convergence. Even though we don't have the airflow necessarily coming together, we do have air coming uh, because of the speed situation. And same thing down here. In this box, we're going to see divergence at upper levels, more air leaving the region because the wind speed here is faster than entering, and that's going to lead to upward motion, lower pressure at the surface. Okay. We call this feature here a trough. At upper levels, we call this feature a ridge. Okay. So in general, we expect to find upper level divergence downstream, usually to the east, of upper level troughs in this type of a region right here and upper level convergence downstream of upper level ridges. And this is going to have implications as to what happens to the surface pressure. Okay. So we have divergence occurring to the east or downstream. This will then lead to lowering pressure at the surface, which will lead to convergence at the surface. Because remember, the circulation around low pressure at the surface is counterclockwise and inward. That's a convergent flow. So you have the convergence at the surface going up and then divergence aloft leading to the upward motion, which is coincident with the fronts and leads to clouds and precipitation. Okay. Uh, this one right here? Yeah. Yes, yes. Good, good question and, and glad you brought it up. Yes, north, south, east, west. It's hard because we're, we're switching a lot between looking at, at cross sections and plan views. So I'm glad you asked the question. Okay. Um, yeah, we're looking at a, at a plan view here. And if we put it together, we can look at an upper level analysis here. Here's our trough at upper levels. Here's our ridge. Divergence showing up downstream of the trough axis, right above low pressure at the surface, our mid latitude low here with a cold front and the warm front. And back here, high pressure. Downward motion here, upward motion here. It all kind of fits together. But in general, determining divergence and convergence at upper levels, more complex than these simple examples we've looked at. We've looked at a fairly regular wave flow here. We have slight variations in wind speed and direction that are going to play a role in determining divergence and convergence, as well as the combination of troughs and ridges of differing wavelengths. We've put a very simple situation up here with, with very clearly defined waves, but in the real world, it's not that easy. Okay? But in the real world, we want to know where the divergence and the convergence are, because that's going to inform us as to where, where features are going to be 
at the surface. So what level do we want to perform our upper level analysis? The answer is lots of levels. Meteorologists look at all kinds of levels through the atmosphere, but we're going to focus today on the 500 millibar situation, and that gives rise to understanding the difference between a constant pressure surface and a constant height surface. We could, if we wanted to, we could say we're going to go up in the atmosphere and we're going to take a look at the weather at 18,000 feet and we're going to draw isobars on the 18,000 foot surface. But meteorologists, once we leave the surface of the Earth, we change from constant height surfaces to constant pressure surfaces. And instead of measuring the uh, pressure on a constant height surface, we measure the height of a constant pressure surface. Why do we do that? Just to confuse people coming to CCA seminars? <laughs> <laughs> Now, it turns out that uh, the mathematical equations, which, which Frank alluded to earlier, and the, and the computational power that's needed to do them, they work a little bit more easily on constant pressure surfaces. And as it turns out, too, the analyses, the different analyses, are analogous. And this will help you figure that out. Okay. Here we have the surface of the Earth. Here we have a constant height surface right here. And here we have a theoretical or uh, 500 millibar surface, exaggerated greatly. So let's take a look at this point here. We're coming up here. Let's say we come up here to this 18,000 foot surface here. Is the pressure here higher or lower than 500 millibars? Lower, because we came up, the pressure falls, 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 because we're going up, hit 500 millibars, it's lower than 500 millibars here, right? How about over here? Pressure higher or lower than 500 millibars? Higher, because we haven't got there yet. Now we look at this position right here on the 500 millibar surface. Is the height of the 500 millibar surface here higher or lower than 18,000 feet? Lower, it's underneath it, right? And here it's higher. So what do we have? Lower pressure, lower height. Higher pressure, higher height. And so it turns out that we can use the height contours as we draw on a 500 millibar chart here. And these are shown in meters with the trailing zero omitted, so actually shown in tens of meters. So this right here is a height of 5,280 meters above sea level. That's where the pressure is 500 millibars. The pressure on this chart everywhere is 500 millibars, but the heights are different. But we can use these, the difference between the height contours, as we call them, to determine wind speed and direction, just as we would between isobars. And we can see here very clearly that if you look where the height contours are closer together, the wind speeds are stronger. So we're looking here, here's 100 knots right here. Okay. Up here, the height contours are farther apart, and we're seeing uh, just 30 knots of wind. And typically on a 500 millibar chart, uh, these winds are put in by a computer. They're not necessarily measured, but they're put in by a computer based on the, uh, the height gradient. And they're only going to be put in there if they are 30 knots or more. So for example, up in this region, the Bering Sea on this particular chart, uh, the, the wind speeds of 500 millibars are less than 30 knots. Okay. So the height here is measured in meters. And you can see in general, it, it ranges from about close to 6,000 meters, especially in the summertime in the lower latitudes to 5,000 meters or even a little bit lower during the winter time, or during the, at the higher latitudes, sorry. In the summertime, this is, uh, the, the heights are not as low in the higher latitudes and a little bit higher down here, and the height gradient is, is much less because, again, keep in mind, it's, it's all back to temperature. Going up through the atmosphere in colder temperatures, the pressure falls more quickly, and so the heights are going to be lower at higher latitudes, especially in the wintertime. In the summertime, it's a little bit different. So get back, getting back to, we're talking about all this esoteric stuff here, but what is it that you guys really want to know about the weather when you're going out there? What is it you really care about, right? Winds and sea state. Maybe you care whether it rains or not, but you really care about this. What produces the wind? Surface pressure differences, right? The isobaric pattern, okay? What causes the pressure to rise and fall at the surface? Convergence and divergence of 500 millibars. That's why we're interested in looking at this. It's a very powerful tool. We can look at where the convergence and divergence is occurring or will occur in the future. That's going to determine where surface highs and lows are likely to develop and how strong they might get or not. Okay? Divergence tends to occur downstream, as we mentioned, at the east of 500 millibar troughs. This leads to lowering pressure at the surface, convergent motion flow, and upward motion. Okay? So again, back to our 500 millibar analysis chart here, the same one that we looked at earlier. Where are the troughs? It's not so easy to find them because they're not, uh, they're not as, as crystal clear as the examples we looked at earlier. So we're, what, we're, what are we looking for here? We're looking for a dip, an equatorward dip in the isohyte contour someplace. And, and in, oftentimes, it's very, very subtle. 
So for example, there's one here, a little bit of a dip here. It, it takes a while to get used to looking at these charts and finding them, finding the features. Here's one up here that's a little easier to see. You can see the dip right through here. Okay. And we can find, find one right here, one right here that's a little more subtle, and another one up here that's a little bit easier to find. So finding these troughs is a little difficult, but they're there. Okay. Surface 500 millibar relationship, this is what it's all about really. Just as the mid-latitude low has a life cycle, a shortwave trough at 500 millibars has a life cycle as well. Flat open wave, if conditions are right, the wave will amplify or deepen. Just like as you watch at the beach, a wave comes in, it's, it's often very flat and as it encounters shallower water, different process entirely, but you see the wave build up and then, and then break with time. Sometimes the trough will strengthen to the point that one or more 500 millibar height contours closes off surrounding a low height center, we call that an upper level low. Sometimes the trough may reach its maximum intensity without ever closing off and then begin to flatten or lift out, okay? If a 500 millibar trough is amplifying or the wave is getting steeper with time, typically it'll lead to a strengthening mid-latitude surface low. Not 100% of the time, but typically. On the other hand, if it's weakening, you're gonna see weakening, but, big but right here. 500 millibar troughs tend to move more quickly than their associated surface lows. So in the life cycle, the 500 millibar feature tends to catch up with the surface low. And when that happens, that's, the low is no longer in that region of upper level divergence likely to produce the best pressure falls and the low is likely to weaken with time. Okay. When a 500 millibar trough or a closed low catches up and it's directly over a surface low, we call it vertically stacked, the surface low will no longer strengthen. Might not go away immediately though especially if it's a strong system. It can become stationary, persist for days. Um, so let's take a, we're gonna take a look at the same charts we looked at earlier, same diagrams we looked at earlier when we looked at the development of the mid-latitude low, now superimposed 500 millibars. We said earlier, we have this stationary front here at the surface, plan view, north, south, east, west. Uh, and we said something comes along and, and lowers the pressure along that front. Well, now we know what that something is at the 500 millibar trough and the divergence associated with it. So with time, that trough may deepen. Here's our low sitting out here, one quarter wavelength. Here's the, the trough axis right here. The ridge axis, keep in mind a wavelength would be a full wave would be your other uh, next trough would be out here, half a wavelength here, a quarter of a wavelength here. There's our low right in that one quarter wavelength downstream position from the trough axis. So that's in a position to strengthen. So with time we get this. Maybe we've had this upper level low now close off here with a closed uh, uh, isohyte contour height contour around a closed low at upper levels, well-developed trough here, well-developed low. And then with time, this is gonna catch up. We see this coinciding with the development of the occluded front here. And this low is no longer likely to strengthen because it's not in a favorable position. But guess what? Look at the triple point here. Where's that triple point with respect to the 500 millibar trough? 500 millibar trough axis back here. So that's where you see your secondary low developing. Going through this very quickly and, and very rudimentarily, but hopefully people are taking away. So rules of thumb, what's a rule of thumb? It's something that's not rigorously scientifically derived, but works pretty well most of the time. Well enough to, to use it, okay? Surface lows tend to move parallel to the 500 millibar flow above them. They will advance one third to one half of the 500 millibar wind speed above them, okay? so. Surface low well northeast of Hawaii in the eastern Pacific. If the 500 millibar winds in this region are southwest 100 knots, what speed and direction will the surface low move? <clears throat> no, it's not gonna move southwest. What's the definition of wind speed, the wind direction? Direction from which the wind is coming. So the low is gonna move northeast 33 to 50 knots. Okay. With the flow and at one third to one half of the 500 millibar wind speed. So all of a sudden you've got a powerful tool here looking at the 500 millibar chart to tell you how a low is gonna move. The 56, 40 meter height contour. If you notice on the chart we looked at before, that contour is placed on the chart in bold, okay? It can be used for determining a storm track and a guideline for the extent of stronger winds. A storm track or the path of low centers tends to lie 300 to 600 nautical miles poleward of the 56, 40, meet height, 40 meter height contour in the Northern Hemisphere. The, the rule of thumb doesn't work in the Southern Hemisphere, but we live in the Northern Hemisphere, so the heck with them, okay? 5640 height contour also often represents the southern extent of surface force seven westerlies, or force six in the summer. So two things, the, the, they can tell you where the storm track is gonna be, how it's gonna be oriented, and a guideline for the extent of stronger winds. And it is shown in bold on all US oceanic 500 millibar charts. 
up to 50% of the 500 millibar wind speed can be translated to the surface to the west of the 500 millibar trough axis in the colder air behind the surface low. Okay. So if you did your uh, bias battle thaw and you had a chart that allowed you to measure the distance between isobars of the surface, and you said, okay, that chart looks like 35 knots of wind back there. But over it, I've got 100 knots at 500 millibars. That says, okay, I've got 35 knots of wind, but maybe a lot of gusts of 50 knots in that area because of downward motion in that region translating some of that momentum to the surface. Okay. Pattern recognition. Four flow patterns at 500 millibars. Zonal, meridional, blocking, cutoff. And we try to identify these because it helps us tell how systems are going to move. Okay, I'm, I'm running through this quickly and I apologize for that because I'm poking into other people's time here. But zonal flow, flow patterns, surface can be expected to track generally west to east. Usually systems will not become very intense. Note the word usually, not always. Sometimes you can get a fairly vigorous uh, 500 millibar trough in a zonal flow that will support a very strong surface system. Meridional flow or flow along the meridians. Surface lows can be expected to track more toward the northeast to the north, and sometimes stronger systems are more likely because the 500 millibar across the waves are deeper, more well developed. Blocking ridges present, surface lows will be blocked from advancing and deflected away. Cutoff lows usually stationary for several days and frequently associated with vertically stacked surface lows. So let's look at a couple of examples. There's a zonal flow across the Pacific here, mostly west to east flow. There are some troughs in here and some waves in the flow, but largely a west to east flow across the entire Pacific basin here. Okay. Contrast that with this more meridional flow, where you have a definite uh, higher amplitude waves present across the Pacific. Here's a trough axis right through here. We might see a low in this direction here, likely to move off to the northeast. Very different than the zonal flow, which would see the low moving more directly toward the east. There's a cutoff low right down through here. Cutoff lows are lows that are cut off from the main flow pattern. This is not a cutoff low here. This is a closed low. There's a difference. This is embedded within the flow pattern. Here, this system is sitting down here just northeast of Hawaii, while the flow pattern, the main flow pattern, is well to its north or poleward. Okay? And that's a system that may hang around for a couple of days. Blocking. High, uh, high latitude ridge sitting in here. This is what's called a Rex block with a high over a closed low. And this is a situation where any system coming along from the west is going to run into this basically big pile of air and be deflected off to the north. And an older look at, a, at this is a Rex block. This is what we call an omega block. This is an older 500 millibar chart showing this high latitude block sitting up right here. And, and along the west coast here, this means what? Probably no storm systems coming in as long as this block persists. This is a uh, chart from April of 2018. What's the flow pattern here? Anybody want to hazard a guess? They're somewhat meridional here, um, in through here. I put this up for a reason, and, and this, is, this illustrates the, uh, uh, the importance of the flow pattern. Here's Hawaii down through here. We've got this flow generally toward the east-northeast here, or from the west-southwest, pointing toward the uh, northwestern United States. Anybody know what that flow might commonly be called? The Pineapple Express. Okay, so this is what you'd be looking at here because, and, and if this persists for a long period of time, and then you get little troughs embedded in this flow pattern, what's that going to mean? Well, system after system coming from down through here, grabbing what? Lots of tropical moisture, and moving toward the northwestern U.S. Those of you who live out here have probably seen the effects of that from time to time. Where we expect surface low pressure? To the east of the troughs. The trough axis might be right through here. Uh, sometimes you hear this referred to as atmospheric river, and this is a, a I'm not going to leave this up for a long period of time. You can find this on the NOAA website. Do a Google search, atmospheric river NOAA. You'll find this particular graphic, and it talks about the idea that these atmospheric rivers, so to speak, which are basically large currents of moisture-laden air, not only at 500 millibars, but at, at all levels of the atmosphere, transporting large amounts of moisture, and then that moisture hits the west coast, and in, in the case of this atmospheric river, what's it hit? Mountains. That air is going to be forced to rise. What's going to happen when the air rises? It's going to cool. You're going to see condensation. You're going to see the development of lots of precipitation, heavy snows in the mountains, and fairly significant rains elsewhere. Quickly, you're going to run through some definitions from this book, the Chen Chesno book. Uh, specialized strong wind belt. The definition is up there. Generalized strong wind belt. I'm not going to 
highlight on that too much, but here's a graphic looking at that overlay with a 500 millibar charge. Here's a specialized strong wind belt. This is his way of looking at the 500 millibar flow, defining the specialized strong wind belt. And this is where the energy is, okay? Uh, it's, we talked about the 5640 line. This is another way of looking at that and, and uh, determining where the energy is and where the problems are likely to occur. Here's a look at uh, a graphic from that book talking about the specialized strong wind belt right here, generalized strong wind belt in through this area here, trough axis right through here, showing that the uh, uh, lows are tracking generally parallel, but with time eventually crossing isolated contours and circulating around becoming vertically stacked with the low. Okay, so mid-latitude lows will develop under the specialized strong wind belt, track generally parallel, but will tend to curve northward once they re leave this belt, move into the generalized strong wind belt, the Model E diagonal can be useful. Okay, there it is again. And again, if you're interested in that, then I would suggest you, you get the book and read it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a light read, but it's, uh, it's uh, interesting nonetheless, okay. Troughs will change as they propagate through the flow pattern. We don't have time to talk about a lot of what's going on there, but uh, the amplifying troughs will uh, lead to perhaps a strengthening surface system and the uh, lifting or flattening troughs will uh, perhaps uh, lead to weakening systems. But again, important, if a 500 millibar trough is lifting or weakening, if surface low is still located downstream of the trough where the divergence is, that surface low can still strengthen, okay? We expect to find surface lows downstream High pressure downstream, here's a, a diagram that shows that. Uh, surface low here, here's the trough. Again, from Chen, uh, Chen and Chesnell, generalized strong wind belt here. Upward motion, surface low, downward motion, surface high. I'm racing through this stuff because I'm running out of time. 500 millibar forecast here. Uh, troughs, the blue dots showing ridges, okay? And we can take that. This is uh, a, a week or so ago, and we can overlay that with a surface chart at Val at the same time. So what do we see? Well, we've got this trough here. Here's a low out ahead of it. This one here, forecast to strengthen, developing storm through here. This one over here, not really showing anything uh, strengthening dramatically, but this ridge axis here associated with the surface high. Same with this ridge axis here. So if you study this stuff long enough, you can see that. Here's another uh, 500 millibar chart. This one might look a little bit familiar uh, because this is the one that supported that Kaiser Shapiro low we looked at earlier. So if you take a look at this and then overlay the 500 millibar features and you see our friend here, this Kaiser Shapiro low, where is it? Well, it's downstream of that 500 millibar trough and a fairly vigorous 500 millibar trough at that. And moving the low forecast to move in this direction parallel to the 500 millibar flow. So what are we really looking for in the 500 millibar charts? Where's there a lot of energy? Strong winds, that implies that this uh, horizontal temperature contrast is great. More likely to see mid-latitude lows develop there. Location of the specialized strong wind belt. What's the, four, what's the flow pattern, the four basic flow patterns we looked at? Um, how is the forecast to change with time? Is that gonna change how surface lows move? Chen Chesno goes into more detail of that. Okay. Uh, did I miss one there? Yeah, where are the troughs and ridges? Hard to find them on OPC charts, but you can try. And as you do it more, you'll get, uh, you'll get better at it. How are they likely to change? Follow the troughs on sequence 500 millibar charts. Okay. Uh, where are the surface systems relative to the 500 millibar features? Are they in a favorable position for divergence to lead to additional pressure falls? Are the associated 500 millibar troughs digging or lifting? Where's the 5640 meter height contour? I remember the, the rules of thumb for guideline for that. So I'm gonna close with looking at charts. This is a 72 hour 500 millibar forecast, valid at 1200 UC, 29 February, 2020. That's today. So what do we see out here? We see an obvious trough here in the Western Pacific, a ridge here, a more meridional pattern, a little bit of a trough in through here. This is 72 hour forecast. So three days ago, this is the forecast. There's our big low sitting up here in the Gulf of Alaska. A system out through here, that little trough moving down in this direction with the flow. 48 hour forecast, so a day later, this is valid the same time. I'm gonna run through these really quickly. And so you can see, Coming here, that's a 24 hour forecast. Here's this morning's analysis, 500 millibar analysis. So you can see if you remember that 72 hour forecast, this is a, was a pretty good forecast. Uh, so it ended up pretty much as forecast. And the surface chart from this morning, again, ended up, there are gonna be some subtle differences here and there, but it's a pretty good forecast. This slide here is only to tell you what I didn't talk about today, which is tropical cyclones. 
Um, if you want to look at the video from last year's presentation, you can learn about those. I, I elected to omit that here because they're not common at all here in the Northwestern United States. <laughs> <laughs>